begin as the stage, begin as the stage. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Backstage at Cry Havoc episode. As ever, I am your host, Lurie Ann Davis, she, her, and today we're going to be talking about the prescriptions, which is something I only learned about from Cry Havoc and we're going to learn the actual history today because today I am joined by David and Amani and our guest historian Dr Emma Southern again who was with us all the way back in I want to say episode five of these backstage episodes it's lovely to have you back it is lovely to be back and can I ask everyone to introduce themselves should we go reverse order this time Emma that's you first all right so I'm Dr Emma Southern I'm a Roman historian I have she her pronouns and I was a consultant for uh, Cry Havoc lovely David I'm David he him I'm sadly not a doctor but I, I did create and head write Cry Havoc hi and I'm Amani I'm the director on Cry Havoc and my pronouns are she her thank you everyone so this is going to be quite a history or historical fact-based episode. Why don't we start with some not fact? <laughs> and why don't we explain <laughs> to Dr. Emma Southern, who has very kindly spent a lot of time sending us accurate Roman facts. Why don't we explain to her what we did with the facts of history? <laughs> and then we can find out how we were wrong. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, David and Armani, yes. what are our prescriptions? What happens at the end of our series? <laughs> well, I feel I feel like the most important thing about the prescriptions is that David decided to put them at the end of the series instead of at the beginning, which is where ah. <laughs> they yeah. actually happened historically, <laughs> chronologically. Yeah, that's, that's the big bombshell. This made very good story sense, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we have a situation at the end of Cry Havoc. Well, throughout the entire series, Gaius and Mark have been trying to pull together enough money to pay off the debts that they owe all the soldiers who fought in the war against Julius Caesar's assassins and those soldiers have been very patiently and then impatiently waiting for their money and then they hit upon the idea of well, the richest people in Rome are the senators and those senators aren't going to give up their money willingly so what if we manage to sort of kill some of them and seize their, their property and their money etc and can we come up with a very cunning way of doing that maybe get just bumping off a few of them and nobody will notice and unfortunately a list of uh, potential senators to kill off is switched by mistake or is it with a, a list of senators who were being invited to Lepidus's birthday party. And that list had several hundred people on it. And uh, now the assassins have gone out to murder several hundred people instead of a dozen. <laughs> Initially, there's a lot of panic, but then Gaius and uh, Mark, um, with uh, Fulvia's help, decide, you know what, we should just own this and we'll come up with a way to, to frame the original senators that we were going to kill. We're going to frame all these murders on them and we'll kill them as well. And that way we'll look like we're quelling a revolt, which sadly bumped off a lot of people but we'll have to seize their money anyway and oh dear how sad never mind <laughs> oh look we've now paid the armies and now we're ready to run a republic together and <laughs> it's a very useful ending to this, to this season of cry havoc the, the big problem is from an historical perspective and why dr emma southern has been uh, you know knocking back several pints of gin <laughs> during that uh, explanation <laughs> is that this is not historically when the prescriptions which are an actual event actually happened and I'm sure Dr. Emma Southern will tell us what the prescriptions actually were and when they actually happened. Yes, I actually know none of this. So <laughs> this is going to be very interesting for me. So um, what were they? Well, yeah. When did they actually happen? See, whenever I was being asked questions about this, I was always like, oh, I, just, I really don't know how they're going to make this funny because they're horrible. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. it turns out that's what you're going to do, so which is pretty funny. So I'll give you. <laughs> well, that's excellent. So yeah, so the prescriptions come at the very beginning of the triumvirate between Lepidus, Octavian, Gaius, and Mark Antony, and they are a list of something like 300 senators and 2,000 equestrians or knights who are going to be executed as traitors to the Republic, oh, my gosh. and they all agree. Basically, they come together to create the triumvirate and to give one another and to agree that they will all rule together, even though they all personally despise one another and have fought wars against one another. And part of the way that they are able to come to terms with one another is to agree that they're all going to kill their personal enemies, basically. And the vast 
majority of the people who were executed were just people who either opposed them on a personal basis or who opposed them politically. So like people who had sided with Pompey or people who had been on the side of Cassius and Brutus who were still around when the prescriptions were done. So this is about the year before Cassius and Brutus are finally defeated. And so what they did was they published these lists. They write up these lists of people. They all kind of swap people that they're going to have executed. So Mark Antony famously gets Cicero. He is allowed to put Cicero on the list. And in response, Octavian gets to have a couple of Mark Antony's generals. And so they kind of swap so everybody loses somebody. Oh my God. So there's a negotiation process. It's a very tense and there's like there's this whole story about how they come together on an uninhabited island in the middle of a river because it's somewhere that none of them control and they all turn up and then they leave their retinues and they all go in individually without anybody. So because they're all at war with each other up until this point and they hate each other. And so it is this kind of very tense negotiation that goes on for a couple of days that they have. And then they publish these lists and they say, everyone on this list is a traitor to the Republic and we're going to kill them all. But we can't really be bothered to do it ourselves. We don't really have the resources because there's no roaming execution force, thankfully, I suppose. (laughs) Um, And so what they do instead is incentivize people to do it to their neighbors or to members of their family. So if you (gasps) kill somebody who is on the prescriptions list and you cut off their head and take it to the Trumpers, then they will give you money. If you're an enslaved person and you take the head, you'll get your freedom and you'll also get some of their stuff. Might get half of their estate or a quarter of their estate. So basically they immediately turn everybody who is on these lists into a character in The Running Man, where everybody around them is suddenly incentivized to murder them with no consequences. (laughs) So it absolutely causes the entirety of Italy to collapse into terror, essentially, because not only do people run around killing the prescribed, they also are running around killing people that they have personal grudges against under the cover of the prescriptions. And there's loads and loads of stories of people killing themselves so before they can be killed of people trying to run away of people disguising themselves and trying to get out of the country of people hiding in attics and in all kinds of things it's basically this period of intense terror that goes on for almost a year where many hundreds of people die (laughs) but octavian eventually wins all of the civil wars so he beats Cassius and Brutus he then manages to defeat Lepidus and Mark Antony and he's the last guy standing and so he kind of very cleverly because he's a genius whitewashes this whole thing the term prescriptions becomes kind of it's such a boring word for <laughs> like a period of true terror and in one of the most kind of interesting ways in all of the sources to us the idea of killing people for their money is kind of the worst part and if you were to just list all of the richest guys and then kill them for their money like that's terrible and that's awful but to the romans that sort of was the mitigation that was presented (laughs) like Mm. they considered oh well he killed the wealthiest ones as a good excuse for doing it if he just said oh well octavian did kill all of these 300 people but it was only because they were his political enemies that sounds bad to romans whereas he killed them for the money sounds logical much more reasonable apparently i mean i'm kind of on board with the killing killing the wealthiest one (laughs) spreading the wealth around but i guess he took it yeah because this is one of the big questions I asked you is how on earth did they get away with it? Because, of <laughs> course, yeah, it, it seems so ludicrous or fantastic that you would say kill off these people. Because presumably a lot of these people on the prescriptions list were not in no way traitors to the Republic. You know, they're all broadly speaking innocent yeah. beyond the fact they didn't like Octave, they didn't like Mark. So how on earth, what, how come the Senate as a whole didn't just stand up and go, no, we're not going to do that? Like, you can't do this. Like, <laughs> is it purely the military might? Is it, well, the people who want the killings done have also got the army behind them, be better do as they say? Or, yeah, was there any kind of resistance to this? Or did everyone just kind of go along with it? Well, it's partly that there is this military might because Antony and Octavian and Lepidus have their own personal armies. And the army ruled by the Senate is currently almost entirely hidden away, attempting 
to defend Cassius and Brutus. Like that's the senatorial army. And they don't really have anything left anywhere near Rome to protect anybody. And anyone who hasn't run off with Cassius and Brutus or who has come back to Rome is not a fighter, shall we say? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like those who like a fight are probably off in Greece so they have basically no protection and the way that the Triumvirs present it is in this kind of very clever rhetorical way where they act as though it is an act of mercy to kill only these 300 people <laughs> because they could kill everybody if they wanted to but they kind of rhetorically present it as that which is not hugely successful like public opinion all of the sources they were pretty clear that they think this is a terrible thing that happened and it was a very very dark time in roman history but the only real way to resist was by helping the prescribed and so what you get is lots and lots of stories about people helping the prescribed to escape or at intervening on their behalf to try to get them off of their prescription lists or hiding them away somewhere or getting them food or just kind of running like a little underground railroad almost to try to protect them um, and try to save as many lives as they could without having to stand up to these people and Octavian is terrifying like he's so scary he's only like 20 at this point and he has raised his own army threatened everybody into letting him be the consul, has beaten up Mark Antony and is now beating up everybody that he can see, essentially. Like, he's so scary. <laughs> and so all you can really do is try to help individuals. There's no real way that you can stand up and say no, because he will absolutely cut your head off as well. And this is an event that I read about and, and said, I need to do a sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> you said this, and they say comedy writers are cruel. <laughs> <laughs> But so, Emma, this makes it sound like the prescriptions essentially went on for, like, a very, very long time. I guess just because that's not what happens in our series. <laughs> for the audience's <laughs> sake, is that, you know, the period of the prescriptions, how long, more or less, did it actually last? Probably talking about a year in waves, but certainly several months. There's one story in... So what, a, a really big source is a guy called Appian who wrote a story book called The Civil Wars. It contains tons of stories, like dozens and dozens of individual stories of people who escaped and didn't escape and took various different actions. And he tells stories of people, they run away and live in the countryside and they run out of food, so they have to come back. There's one guy who's, I'd say my personal favorite, who lives in the countryside disguised as a peasant for a few months and then gets so fed up with peasant life and decides that he cannot live a life of poverty so he just takes his own life because he would <laughs> genuinely rather be dead than a Roman peasant uh, <laughs> which I think is why <laughs> but it is like a month long process and then even when people have think they're safe and they try to get back into the city months later people will still come for them so it, it kind of constantly rolling in waves for a period of many months and then in terms of uh, like you were saying Gaius is really scary sort of beating everyone <laughs> up so was and, and that he's beaten up Mark Antony he's beaten up Lepidus so how long did they work together as a triumvirate mm. they mm, technically 10 years ish yeah <laughs> with varying levels of peace during that time but they get five years and then it's renewed where they give themselves this power to kind of keep the republic in order but yeah with varying levels of them being friends with each other during that time <laughs> there's the scene of them coming together to come up with a list of names to kill is depicted in shakespeare's julius caesar it's a very quick scene i think it's the only scene certainly Lepidus in it where they come together but otherwise it, it, it's an event which is seldom really depicted all that much I know it was covered in HBO's room but I've got a feeling actually that the entirety of Cry Havoc in terms of the events it portrays or the, or the, t the span of time takes place like between two scenes in HBO's <laughs> room you really have decided to stop. there's a big battle and there's a big battle and we've gone no we want the admin in the middle yeah yeah but in terms of story in real history Yes, well, they form Tran, but they do the prescriptions then. Then they have the Battle of Philippi and then the rest of the show. So I really did take the prescriptions from what would have really been an event before Cry Havoc begins and put it in the last two episodes of this season. Mainly as a, 
I couldn't really imagine looking at the characters we were creating that they'd be the sort of people to have wholesale murdered about <laughs> 300 or so senators before the series began because they just seemed too likeable and silly. Yeah. And therefore I thought that's something they really needed to do later because even just listening to the explanation that Emma gave there is clearly a horrific, yeah. horrible time to yeah. live. I had no idea. <laughs> is it analogous in the way you said it there? It's just the richest people and everyone's out to kill the richest people. It almost sounds uh, sort of like the reign of terror, the French Revolution. Yeah. Except it's actually, this one has been started by actually those actually at the top of the tree anyway. So it's awful, but a masterful sort of cynical populist move. That kind of, you know, take them, I'm on your side. I'm a, the richest man here, but I'm also a man of the people. <laughs> but they're your enemy over there. Take them down. It's like, you know, yeah. it's a horrible rhetorical thing. It is. But that is exactly what the the two sides in all of the civil wars, all of the Roman civil wars, are the um, optimates, which means the best men. And they're basically just straightforward oligarchs who say, you know, the rule should be with the best men, which is surprisingly us. <laughs> and it should be plebeians should have no say in anything that happens in the state. And then you get the populares, like Julius Caesar, who says, no, public opinion. He's like a pure populist. And so all of the Trumvirs are populists and the senators are optimates. And so this is very much a we the people, by which I mean me, the richest guy in Rome, <laughs> with all of you behind me, against these other guys who are also very rich, but we don't like them. But the, you know, the, this populist element is very much taking control of Rome. Yeah. I knew that I wanted the prescriptions to be part of this series back when I first started even plotting it in like, I think 2020, at the very, very earliest sort of conception of, of the idea and very much looking at the sort of at that time uh, Boris Johnson's somewhat populist government I certainly had no idea by the time series come out we'd be two prime ministers <laughs> along yeah. but sadly the sort of politics of populism though uh, not yet quite to the extent of going out and murdering all the richest people in the streets <laughs> for, the, for the sake of your government that populist politics are still sadly very much in the ether and that that was certainly something I had in mind even if in this series it's sort of presented more like I suppose, actually, in a way, I, I thought, from an audience perspective, the idea that these characters would just draw up a list of people to murder, stick out in public, and the public would do it, sounded too fantastical. It sounded <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it happening. So, actually, the idea that it was a kind of mistake, you know, oh, some scrolls have been mixed up, and the assassins have gone off, and, oh, we're going to have to quickly, do we, do we ignore <laughs> this? Do we spin this? Oh, my God, let's try and own it, and sort of the panic, until eventually it becomes a kind of public event, seemed to me more likely, because I thought, it sounds like something you do by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> lose control of it but then at the very end of uh, episode 20 we have this of uh, an insinuation that Gaius Octavian knew exactly what he was doing and has kind of sort of orchestrated this knowing it would happen because he is potentially that, <laughs> that much <laughs> of a plotter. It's the kind of thing he would do so. I think I, I thought to take such a, an event of monumental awfulness and tragedy and just to make it a kind of you know a sort of slightly satirical almost farcical thing I found that very funny but I thought it might also be somewhat somewhat disrespectful but the idea at least at the end that no you know the real prescriptions were carried out by people level-headed not level-headed who knew exactly what they were doing shall we say that there is still a flavour of that in this series that maybe guys is exactly the sort of person who would genuinely plan something like this and allow it to happen. I mean, yeah. To be honest, when when I realised that the prescriptions actually would have happened before the start of our series and that David had had restructured the story, I, I just felt like it's great um, storytelling. It's really funny, <laughs> I think. <laughs> it, like, this idea that these three men who were in charge of running the most powerful republic in the world have made such a monumental mistake and are actually killing their friends like people they actually like and it's like oh oh no that was a big mistake how do we and now how do we cover this I mean I think I find panic and, and stress just quite yeah. funny anyway and then yeah that little twist at the end the little reveal I think yeah when the first time I read that in the first draft that David sent me of episode 20 it did genuinely send a little shiver down my spine I was mm. like oh yes and, and now <laughs> the hints of Augustus are coming this way <laughs> there's our boy <laughs> it shows I suppose how well Augustus managed to spin this himself later but why is it I always get this sense that Augustus is vaguely remembered as yeah quite good you know he did a good job doing this I always get the sense that Octavian and Augustus are often treated like two entirely different people in history why is it do you think that we don't associate this figure at the very beginning of the Roman Empire the end of the Republic we kind of don't associate him with this horrible, you know, this essentially like a massacre of people. It's an awful, awful sort of uh, thing to, to have instigated. 
why is it that we, we still to this day almost think of him as two different people and like the, the later grand leader of Rome is not the conniving murderer that he was in his youth? Largely because that was his design completely, is completely by his own hand that we that we know about Augustus. And he, you know, having his name changed to Augustus, which means like the most reverent one. And <laughs> as soon as he wins all of the wars, as soon as Mark Antony is gone in 31 and he has his final triumph and he comes back to Rome, sits down and then turns all of his unlimited attention onto completely reshaping himself and how people perceive him and he's like right the war part of my life is over he's still not very old when this happens (laughs) but he completely turns to shaping the image of himself as statesman and as quite religious statesman and he gets really obsessed with like traditional values and bringing back how things used to be largely in a way that he's made up but he not only does he reshape how he himself is named and seen and starts presenting himself in public in all you know with his head covered and things like that but also reshapes the city of rome so that it completely it feeds into this new image that he is creating so he builds a forum and covers it in all of these mythological images which are all like about Aeneas so then he aligns himself very strongly with Aeneas as the founder and creator of Rome and as coming through the wars in order to and then you can't criticize Aeneas so you can't really criticize Augustus and then he starts to shape laws and things so that everybody has to live life as he wants them to live and by the time he dies in his 80s he's been doing that for 40 years There's entire generations that did not know that Augustus was Octavian. They only know him as the great Augustus. You know, when you only see him as the nice little old man or as Reverend Augustus. And then he also has a really intense control over the production of art and literature. He controls that so carefully and produces huge amounts of histories like like the Aeneid, like all of Virgil's works, like Ovid's works and all of this stuff that we think of as being foundational to what Romanness is are all produced under Augustus, under Augustus's directions and if you aren't producing work that fits in with the image of Augustus as he would like you to be <laughs> then your work does not get spread around basically. <laughs> I'm just throwing some questions. It's my opportunity to geek out and talk about history. <laughs> As a final geeky question for me, it's probably speculation. But um, to what extent do you think Octavian slash Augustus was undeniably in many ways an awful person? But in what ways do you think he was sincere in, I suppose, the difference between self-interest and sort of, so we say, civic interest? Like, obviously, he cared a huge amount about himself. But to what extent do you think he genuinely cared about the people in a sort of in a genuine way of leading the Republic? Of Is there a sort of a, a great civic interest, um, Augustus, and that he believes he is the best person to make the most of Rome? Or is it purely self-interest on his part? I think that he, and he's not the only person who knows this, but I think he knows that the Republic can't continue because, you know, the civil wars between Julius Caesar and Pompey are the second lot of civil wars. as Marius and Sulla before that. It's been nearly 100 years of men rising and clashing and rising and clashing. And it's come to a point where there has to be one winner. And I think that he is smart enough and pragmatic enough to see that there can't be a situation especially in like what happens in the aftermath of Julius Caesar's murder is that the assassins really do think that things can go back to normal that if they kill Julius Caesar that they they can just go back to having their lovely republic and everybody can have a go at being a consul and you know you've got the 600 senators and they can all have a lovely time and everybody gets a go but it's such a naive perspective that Augustus even when he's 18 19 years old can see right through and he's like there's going to be another one someone is going to gather the power the military power the resources the political power and it's going to just keep happening over and over again unless we kind of resolve this i think in the beginning it is largely self-interest it's largely him turning up saying i'm the new julius caesar but by the time he is creating the system that becomes the imperial system which technically is entirely within the law of the republic but stands completely outside of it. It is a very calculated way of ending 
the Republic and preventing those wars from happening again. It's not perfect because you eventually, after a couple of hundred years, you just get like 17 people declaring themselves emperor and banging into each yeah. other. But he does a very good job of ending the civil wars and creating the Pax Romana, which does last for a very long time and allowing Rome and the empire to kind of live and breathe for a while without having to constantly be torn apart by the wars of the late Republic. So I think it begins as self-interest, but I do suspect that very quickly it is about ending the nightmare. Yeah, you say uh, Octavian Augustus, one of history's most successful supervillains? He is a great supervillain, yes. Like, that's basically what his thing is, like, that he wants to rule the world in order to stop it from being... He's going to be a tyrant about it, and he is, yeah. but it is to stop worse things from happening. <sighs> he, he's someone I find him absolutely fascinating. My heart is with Lefanus, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but my brain is fascinated with Octavian Augustus because he manages to do everything seemingly just through lots of planning and hard work and lots yeah. of doing forms. He fills in lots of forms. It's when micromanagement <laughs> goes right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Supreme micromanagement and it works. Yeah. And as a head writer on a series, I like to see it work out. <laughs> Just making a quiet note to keep an eye on you, David. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> If he starts writing a res gestae of his achievements, then start to work. <laughs> Amani, I'd like you to go and just dramatise this. David, it's just a list of reasons you're great. <laughs> I said go forth, Amani. <laughs> Take it to the people. I mean, wow. What? This is just... This is, I've learned a lot in this <laughs> 35 minutes. You've learned that the Romans are horrible at every level. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something I'm interested in, it seems to be the assumption that the prescriptions were Octavius's idea, because Mark and Leper just seem to have disappeared <laughs> from this conversation. They lose, you see. Mm. Yeah. It also doesn't really get attached. You know, nobody's talking about Mark Antony, the guy who did the prescriptions. So the fact that the responsibility gets shared between them and that very cleverly the fact that they don't do any killing themselves and none of them are even like nearby really when it's happening. They're all in different countries mean that none of their kind of stigma. The only thing, because Mark Antony kills Cicero and the story about Fulvia taking Cicero's tongue and hands and nailing them to the Senate house door. Um, yes. <laughs> She's great. That's a story you should go into more, I guess, because one of the reasons for dramatic effect, uh, yeah, at this time, the triumvirs would have been in different areas of the Republic. Of course, for this series, we put them all together in Rome and often in the same room, so they can have scenes together and, <laughs> you know, have, have lunch together. And so they are all together when they, all this is kicking off. But Fulvia, Mark Antony's wife, is in this series, Fulvia, who I'm astonished, seems is very rarely depicted mm. in dramatizations of this period. When I read about her, I thought, this is such a fascinating figure who seems to have like has had several marriages to very prominent men mainly ones who've ended up causing lots of riots and <laughs> lots of political yeah. machinations and we do have Fulvia as someone who though it's certainly not her idea to do this is someone who comes in and she's quite a schemer she likes to Armani what's the best way of describing Fulvia she, she has an assassin's network nice she I mean she's just very cool to me <laughs> Yeah. Super pragmatic. She's the one who comes in and says, look, if you're going to do this terrible thing, you may as well do it properly. Here's a list of assassins that I can trust and then send them <laughs> off to do it. Amazing. I, I think Fulvia is one of my, again, favourite historical characters of this period who I'm, I'm just baffled is very rarely seems to turn up in, yeah. in TV depictions or plays. It's just never there. She's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I think because she's such an easy wife to cut out. And she couldn't <laughs> be in there in her own right, of course. Yeah. Actually, so. Justice yeah. for Fulvia. <laughs> oh, justice for Fulvia. Is Fulvia in your book of 21 women that made Rome? She's not. She nearly was, but it had two late Republican women already. So, I've, And in the end, yeah. I went with Clodia, who is her sister-in-law, otherwise known as the Palatine Medea, Ooh. who had her own feud with Cicero who did a whole big speech about her why does Cicero manage to piss off this many women what's he I doing mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then I have a woman called Turia who actually saved her husband from the prescriptions oh, hey. oh. amongst many other things so she's the subject of the longest private Latin funerary inscription that we have or the longest private inscription that survives at all that tells her whole life story including how she negotiated with Octavian and with Lepidus in order to save her husband from being executed in the prescriptions. And since that has brought us full circle, I'm going to use that <laughs> as an out. So thank you so much. Would you like to continue? Where can people get your work and plug away, basically? 
yeah, so you can find everything at emmasouthern.com. And uh, my podcast is called History is Sexy, and we answer people's history questions that they can't be bothered to Google themselves. And my next book is out in September 2023, and it's A History of the Roman Empire in 21 Women, including those two. Fantastic. <laughs> I've enjoyed this so much. Yeah, <laughs> it's been excellent. I've just been standing here listening like, we should make this a series, just talking to you about yeah. this. <laughs> So I guess I should just listen to your podcast, really. <laughs> totally. Maybe I'll do that instead, and everyone else should as well. <laughs> yeah, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining me, and thank you, listeners, for listening. I hope you enjoyed that peek into history. And we will be back next week for a final backstage, I believe, which is just a general chin wag. So I'm not really sure what that's going to be, but come back next week to find out. <laughs> and stay safe. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Backstage at Cry Havoc is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. It is directed by Armani Zardo, produced by Laurie Ann Davis, with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner. This episode was edited by Laurie Ann Davis and Catherine Vanella. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.